All right. Aloha ahiahi. All right. And e haole makahiki ho. Yeah, there's about three people. Yeah, okay. That was Happy New Year. Thank you so much for coming out tonight and welcome to Hawaii Volcanoes National Park, our uh, After Dark in the Park program. And this month, in fact, this entire month, we're kicking off Volcano Awareness Month. USGS is going to be uh, contributing speakers for all Tuesdays of January for Volcano Awareness Month. I think it's a pretty good way to kick off 2017. What do you think? Yes, yes. woohoo! I agree. Um, and we've got a really great speaker tonight. Uh, my boss thought it would be really cool if we coordinated something to celebrate something that occurred January 3rd, 1983, out on the east rift of this volcano. Does anybody remember what happened? The Pu'u event opened up, and today happens to be January 3rd, so what a great way to celebrate is by having this special presentation. And we thought it might be fun are we going to do this, boss? We thought it might be fun to do a happy birthday to Pu'u O'o. <laughs> so, <laughs> I want to hear you guys Hawaiian. Are we ready? Here we go. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, Pu'u O'o. <laughs> happy birthday to you. Woo! How do we do, boss? She's smiling. That's good. All right. <laughs> Our speaker tonight, Dr. Christina Neal, uh, she is the scientist at, in charge at HVO. And just so you know how significant that is, Christina, you are only the second woman to hold that position in HVO's 103-year existence. Is that right? That, that is something. From 1983 to 1989, Tina lived here in Hawaii. In fact, one of her great days at work was being up on Mauna Loa in 1984 while the eruption of Mauna Loa was going off, and then that afternoon coming back down to Kilauea. Imagine for a volcanologist, two volcanoes one day, two eruptions. That's, that's a good day at work. Um, in 1990, she moved to Alaska to work at the newly created AVO in Anchorage. She was there uh, for 25 years, working as a USGS geologist in the Alaska Alaska Volcano Observatory. In 1998, she accepted a two-year assignment in Washington, D.C. as the first USGS geoscience advisor to the Office of U.S. Foreign Disaster Assistance. Um, and in those travels, she went to Thailand, Nepal, Ecuador, Colombia, and Kazakhstan to review and assist with the implementation of hazard mitigation programs. We are happy to have her back in Hawaii. Our scientist in charge, Dr. Christina Neal. Well, thank you for that nice introduction, Dean, and uh, thank you to the National Park Service for hosting all these After Dark in the Park talks as part of Volcano Awareness Month and actually the program that goes on all through the year. It's, a, it's great to be here, and I'm really looking forward to sharing some updates on what's going on at Kilauea Volcano, which is one incredible part of the volcano story of the Big Island. Um, but I also want to shout out to my colleagues at the Hawaiian Volcano Observatory where I work. I'm really pleased that a couple folks are here tonight. Can I just have you stand up so we can thank you for your ongoing hard efforts working this volcano eruption? Jeff and Tim. And in the very back of the room is Janet Babb, who is a geologist and our outreach scientist who really, along with uh, Jim Kawaiikawa, my predecessor, really had the vision for this Volcano Awareness Month, which is a whole month-long series of presentations and lectures about volcanoes of Hawaii, and it's all about informing the public and the visitors and helping people learn to live safely with the volcanoes of the Big Island. And so as Dean said, this really is an auspicious day, the birthday of Pu'o'o, uh, 34 years ago. I wasn't here for that actual beginning of the event. I came in June of 1983, so I missed the actual birth date. But I do remember Pu'o'o when it was just a very small mound of spatter. And now it's this gigantic landform out on the East Rift Zone, more than 800 feet high. So we've had a lot of action in 34 years. And what we're going to do tonight is uh, recap very qu quickly, if I can, sort of the first 33 years of what's been going on at Kilauea since 1983, and then focus in a little bit more on the update of what's happened in this last year. Now, you've managed to come to Kilauea, visitors and residents know this, during a very auspicious and unique time. Kilauea Volcano has actually two eruptions going on simultaneously at this time. We have a summit eruption going on just two miles from here, down in the Halema'oma'o crater, 
and then the Pu'u'o'o eruption going on 10 miles from here on the East Rift Zone. In historic time, or at least in the last 200, 250 years, this is the longest time where we've had two eruptions going on on the same volcano for this long. So it's a very unique time, and it gives us a lot of opportunities as scientists to understand the plumbing and the structure of the volcano, since we have it basically erupting in two places that are connected by ways we're still defining. Okay, well, let's just get started with a little bit of background, so we make sure we're all on the same page. Here is a, a blow up of the big island of Hawaii. And of course, we're about 200 miles or so southeast of Oahu, Honolulu, where many people arrive when they first visit the state. The big island, as it's known, is the largest of the Hawaiian, main Hawaiian islands, and it's where the young volcanoes are. They're outlined here on this slide, and uh, the historically active volcanoes, those that have erupted in the last 200, 250 years or so, include Hualalai over Kailua Kona, Mauna Loa, which makes up half of the island, and then young Kilauea here on the southeast part of the Big Island. And tonight's talk will be focused, again, on eruptions at Kilauea Volcano. So here's a, a zoom in to the Kilauea Volcano part of the Big Island. Kilauea is a classic shield volcano. It has uh, a broad, gently shaped topography with a summit caldera system. Outlined there in red, the caldera is a large collapse feature, about three by two miles across. Uh, and it formed in a violent series of eruptions um, centuries ago. And then Kilauea also has two rift zones, the southwest rift zone and the east rift zone. These are linear zones or belts of frequent eruptions that have formed uh, long ridge-like structures that go 125 miles in this case, 35 miles in this case, uh, away from the summit caldera, sites of frequent eruption. And so the two eruptions we're going to talk about tonight, one, the Pu'u'o'o eruption out here on the Middle East Rift Zone, again, about 10 miles from where we're sitting tonight, and then the summit eruption in Halemaumau Crater, just two miles away from where we're sitting right here at the Visitor Center. Just also to set the stage about how Kilauea Volcano works in a very gross, kind of simplistic sense, this is a classic cartoon showing a cross-section through Kilauea Volcano, which is a, a good example of most shield volcanoes. In this cross-section, you see the summit caldera, the collapse feature here at the top. And then uh, in this feature, in this picture, we're indicating the east drift zone running off in this direction from the summit. This red region here illustrates what we think of in a bit of a cartoon sense as the magma plumbing system. So melt rises from deep within the earth, more than a 60 kilometers or 30, 40 miles depth, up some sort of vertical pipe system and it accumulates in a reservoir system that's between one and, and two or three, four miles below the summit, below your feet when you're standing up there at Jagger Overlook. Uh, we know it's a little more complex than a big round balloon, but for simplicity's sake, that's a good, a good way to portray it. And it's this summit reservoir system that holds the magma that comes up from the deep source and eventually feeds the eruption at the summit. And some of that magma leaks away down the East Rift Zone to feed the Pu'u'u'u eruption on the, on the, uh, out, out the East Rift Zone. What this cartoon also illustrates to you is how we can use a technique known as deformation monitoring to see what's going on inside the volcano. You can imagine in your mind's eye that as melt, molten rock accumulates in this reservoir complex, like a balloon, it's gonna get bigger, pressure is going to increase, and what will happen is that the summit of the volcano will rise in elevation, and the, the flanks of the volcano up near the summit will tilt away from the increasing pressure source. And we have instruments called tilt meters and, of course, GPS, which you're familiar with, which can measure that change in slope of the ground and the change in elevation of the ground as the volcano responds to changing magma storage in that summit reservoir system. This will come back when we talk about how Kilauea has been behaving. So first, let's zoom in on the Kilauea East Rift Zone eruption at Pu'u'u'u, the one that began 34 years ago today, just after midnight, and is still going on. We're going to jump through a series of maps here to kind of bring you up to the present day. And these maps show uh, the regions of lava flows that have, been in that have inundated parts of Kilauea volcano during the 34 years of the Pu'u'u'u eruption. The first uh, three years of the eruption series, all real, most, of, occur, most of the activity occurred at Pu'u'u'u, this vent right out here, almost on the National Park boundary. And just to remind you again, we're sitting up in a building right about in here. Uh, each of these episodes of activity that occurred about a month apart lasted, oh, anywhere between six hours and 24 hours, produced very high fountains of lava 
reaching up to 1,500 feet above the ground, and uh, fast-moving rivers of lava that moved away from the high fountains and formed eventually, uh, near the vent, they formed these smooth, liquid pahoehoe flows, and then downstream transitioned into these rubbly aa uh -uh flows that moved away from the vent downslope in these long fingers. And most of them went to the southeast, some went to the northeast early in the series, uh, but you notice none of them reached the ocean. Some came close, uh, but most of them went downslope. Some of them invaded the Royal Garden subdivision, and over the course of these three years, destroyed about 16 structures. So this was the episodic high fountaining period of eruption at Puuo, and many people who lived here uh, back then remember hearing your windows rattling at night when the high fountainings began and saw a deep glow off in the east. So between 1986 and 1992, there was a change in location of eruption. The uh, Pu'o event went quiet, and the locus of lava effusion jumped downrift to a, what became a, a growing lava shield in a lava lake known as Kupayanaha. And for five and a half years, lava essentially continuously welled out of the ground into a lava lake system, and then transitioned downslope through lava tubes all the way to the ocean. Lava first hit the sea in uh, November of 1986, so just 30 years ago, this last November. And over the course of that five and a half years, uh, lava spread out along the coastline and invaded some of the communities down here on the south coast, uh, eventually destroying 168 structures. So this was the most destructive phase of this ongoing Pu'o eruption. It resulted in a lot of loss of, of homes in that region. From 1992 to 2007, activity jumped back to Pu'o'o, a few excursions up rift, uh, but again, lava, be lava effusion became mostly continuous, and the flows sent to the southeast, repaving a great deal of the Hawaii Volcanoes National Park coastline and extending the coastline in many places. A couple of additional structures in Royal Gardens were destroyed to, in that, uh, let's see, 15-year period. From 2007 to 2011, by this time Pu'o'o was a very large edifice and there were periods when uh, the, the edifice itself became overpressurized and broke open, producing a fissure eruptions along these crack systems that propagated away from Pu'o'o. And some of these became long-lived, again sending lava flows to the sea, uh, destroying additional structures in Royal Gardens and in the southern part of the, of the uh, coastline. Notice that some of the lava flows also went to the northeast from the eruption system, kind of foreshadowing what was to come. From 2011 to 2014, there were additional outbreaks from Pu'o'o, sending lava south and to the northeast again, and then also some uprift activity back towards the summit of the volcano that produced short lava flows uh, during periods of, of outbreak. And then in June of 2014, a, a phase of activity began that uh, stick is very familiar to many people living on the island right now. The June, on June 27th, there was an outbreak on the northeast flank of the Pu'o'o lava cone uh, that became a long-lived vent, and lava began to move to the northeast uh, towards inhabited areas. And I'd like to introduce to you, at this point, the concept of steepest line of descent. Uh, residents will know what I'm talking about, but you see these blue lines draped over the map here? This is essentially, you can think of it as a drainage network. What uh, our scientists did is take the digital elevation model or the topographic model of the island and draw have the computer draw lines where lava or water or any fluid would run, kind of like in a river if you poured it on the surface. So it, it was discovered that this is a, a fairly good technique to help us forecast where lava flows might go since they are a form of fluid. So on June 27th, uh, this lava flow broke out, began heading to the northeast, and over the next months, uh, it accelerated through the, the unburned forest here out in the, the East Rift Zone on state land, and then took a little jog to the north, just around some inhabited areas here, and headed towards the town of Pahoa in Puna. It was a very stressful time uh, for scientists who were trying to forecast what was going to happen and give people the best guidance to help them make decisions about whether to evacuate or not, and working with emergency managers and civil defense, and certainly a very stressful time for residents who saw this lava flow coming downhill at them. Eventually, the lava flow uh, destroyed one structure, one home, burned it completely to the ground, and partially inundated a waste transfer station. Here's the main part of the Pahoa village, the Pahoa village road. 
It also inundated part of a cemetery, which you can just barely see. Let's see, I think right in here. Here's a shot of what the lava looked like. It was dribbling down into the waste transfer station in Pahoa, right through the fence. Didn't act as much of a barrier there. One of the interesting things about this eruption is that as the lava flow progressed, it gave infrastructure managers time to prepare and think about what can we do to deal with this oncoming lava flow. And uh, there were several roads crossing perpendicular to the path of this flow, which had power poles. And so working with some of the volcanologists on the island, uh, the HELCO engineers devised a, an experiment to see if they could protect this pole from the lava by insulating it, piling cinders around the base, putting heat reflective tape and foil up the pole, uh, adding a wire mesh with more rock to try to uh, give it some insulation. I will say that this particular pole was surrounded and uh, it, the, pr the protection worked pretty well, except they didn't account for heat coming in from the ground. And so it actually began to burn from below. Um, they were able to eventually put in a new power pole away from the lava to keep the line suspended. So uh, it did its job. And this, this experiment was of interest enough that we actually have a New Zealand scientist coming later this year to work with HVO and HELCO and others to, to learn from this experience and see if we can uh, make this a practical tool for other folks elsewhere who are going to learn to deal with lava flows. Well, just to cut the Pahoa sh story short, it had a pretty happy ending except for that one house. The lava flow stopped uh, within a few hundred meters or yards of the main highway, but likely because of a, of a very low supply rate and cooling this far down flow and an increasing crystallization, the lava flow just didn't have enough oomph to keep going. And it backed up in the system to this point uh, by in late October, and then another finger went this way, but stopped again short of the road. So Paho was spared inundation, but uh, people were not spared a lot of disruption preparing for the potential of this flow uh, coming into their backyards. Between April 15 and May 2016, most of the lava flow activity uh, occurred within about four or five miles of the Pu'o event as the lower portion basically stalled and backed up in the system. At that point, just small short flows overplating pre-existing flows and uh, sending new little shoots up into the forest here. That time, uh, the biggest nuisance at that point was that smoke from the burning fires was heading downwind to folks uh, up in the, actually the Kilauea summit area and these subdivisions. But I left the blue lines of descent on this map in part to illustrate that we were watching carefully to see if any of these fingers got enough life in them that they might have started down these paths and back towards inhabited areas. Luckily, they did not. And then in May of 2016 of this year, uh, we had a period of time where the volcano became extremely pressurized, full of magma at the summit. We saw a lot of increase in elevation at the summit and increase in the tilt that we were talking about earlier. Earlier, The lava lake up here was high. Pu'o'o cone became engorged with melt. And eventually, there were breakouts on the side of Pu'o'o cone. This is the beginning of the famous 61G episode, the 61st episode in this long-running series, producing these two lava breakouts. This is what they look like uh, from the air that next morning after May 26. This is one of the lobes of lava coming out of the Pu'o'o cone, and then the other lobe coming out to the east over here. Very quickly, this uh, northernmost lobe sort of died down, and the easternmost one became dominant quickly developed a lava tube system. This is a great aerial shot of a skylight looking down into one of these subterranean lava tubes. This is about 20 feet across, and this lava was rushing very rapidly below surface. I put this in here partly to show how treacherous these skylights can be. Look at this thin crust that you might in, uh, inadvertently wander across if you're walking out there. So here's a, a map showing the 61G lava flows by late June. The northern flow had stopped and all the activity was heading east and south right along the National Park boundary following these blue lines uh, that we had updated heading towards the coast. And it was going to nick what was left of the corner of Royal Garden subdivision. Nobody was there at the time. As the uh, lava flow transitioned towards the steep part of the south coast in this region where there's a lava flow mantled fault scarp. It picked up speed and transitioned from Pahoehoe to A'a, the more rubbly flavor of lava flow. Here it is with a person for scale. And then as it got over the poly uh, in late June and into July, it transitioned back, was able to sustain a lava tube at that point down the poly and feed Pahoehoe back onto the coastal plain, which looks like this, the person for scale. This is a classic sort of advancing, budding, a series of buds and toes from a Pohoihoi flow 
moving across the coastal fl flats. In July, the 61G lava flow crossed the emergency road that's down there on the south coast of, of the volcano. Now this gravel road, I don't know, many of you have probably walked out or biked out on this, was actually constructed during the Pahoa crisis as a potential emergency egress route for people of Pahoa. If the lava flow had cut their main route to Hilo, they would have been able to take a long drive through the national park to get out. Um, thankfully, they didn't have to use it, and sadly, it was covered again here in late, in late July of 2016. But for visitors, uh, it was a great sight because you could walk out there on the gravel road. When the flow first crossed the road, it was only a few tens of inches high, a classic pahoehoe sheet. You could get quite close. So this was late on the 25th, and uh, on the, right after midnight on the 26th, lava dribbled over the sea cliff into the ocean. This was the first time that we'd had Kilauea lava reaching the sea since 2013. This is a great before and after shot of the lava flow crossing that road on July 25th, and then here about 10 days later with a person for scale, you see how much it's thickened. This is a classic behavior of Pahoehoe lava that it inflates or thickens through time as continued flow within the lava flow actually adds more bulk and volume and the surface actually rises as it inflates. Here's an aerial shot showing what the lava flow looked like as it was going over the sea cliff here about maybe uh, 15, 25, 20 meters, so 50 feet or so high. Here's the active flow going into the ocean producing a small plume. And here it is in late September. By this time, uh, the lava flow had formed a couple of branches, one to the east and one to the west. And so it was actually adding new material over the sea cliff in, in a delta on the west and on the east. Uh, we refer to this as the Kamakuna lava entry, Kamakuna being a geographical name for that part of the south coast. Uh, and in late uh, September, this, this western delta uh, really became inactive and all of the lava was coming down on the eastern side, um, feeding this growing delta here. Here's a telephoto shot of what that looks like with lava going into the sea. By this time, a, a delta or bench of material had prograded, built out from the old sea cliff, and you can see little streams of molten rock pouring into the ocean here. It's quite a sight, of course, seeing that interaction of the cold seawater and the 2,000 degree lava. And here's a map, our most recent publicly shared map, showing the status of the 61G lava flow as of mid-December. And so you can see this long uh, 11 kilometer or seven mile or so long lava flow hitting the ocean here. This red was the most recently active part of the growing lava delta cutting the emergency road. Um, it's a little bit faint, but you might see a yellow line or a couple lines coming down the center of this lava flow. That's the mapped trace of the lava tube that was delivering lava underground. Uh, to the sea. And that flow is, that tube is mapped a couple of ways by looking with your eye for fume coming out of the, of the lava and also by using a thermal camera from a helicopter and you can see actually the thermal signature of that hot lava tube beneath the crust. And I just want to point out for those of you who live here and are going to be watching this into the future, there's a little bud coming off the uh, Pu'uo'o that's still active here. There was another break, couple of breakouts in the last couple months. At this point, it's pretty weak and mild, uh, but of course we're watching it. And if it should for somehow capture the, the bulk of the flow at some point and starve this current flow, it'll probably follow a different path down to the coast. But it's still very, very sluggish at this point. Okay, well, I want to talk a little bit about lava deltas, in part because New Year's Eve, we had a really exciting event down there at the coastline. Uh, these lava deltas are a phenomenon that HVO scientists and others have observed repeatedly during the course of this 34-year East Rift Zone eruption. And again, this is where lava reaches the ocean, goes over the sea cliff, and basically builds out a bench, or a better word for that is a delta of new land moving into the sea. Now, the topography of the submarine environment here off the south coast of Kilauea is very steep. There's not a long, gentle shelf. It goes down very deep, very steeply. And so, as you can imagine, as material hits the ocean, much of it fragments and, and, and breaks apart during that rather violent interaction of cold water and hot lava. And so, mixed in with the new lava extending out here is a, is a very rubble-rich material that forms the base of a more solid lava flow that extends out. So in your mind's eye, what you'll see is a, is a, uh, a shelf of rather solid looking lava, but it's built on a base of rubble. 
unstable rubble that you can imagine doesn't hold up well as water, underwater is, is interacting and, and uh, mixing with that. Because of these deltas um, being hazardous, I didn't really explain that very well, but what, what eventually can happen is that that rubble layer beneath this shelf can actually get eroded away by the wave action and then the shelf basically collapses into the sea. And that, those collapses happen very suddenly and uh, of course if you're standing anywhere on this you're, you're likely to, to lose your life. Uh, and if you're standing very near it, as these people were in late August, this, uh, these, these collapses can also produce explosions of debris that fly high into the sky, send rocks the size of uh, you know, washing machines up onto the land. So uh, the other thing that can happen is during these collapses there can be waves propagating through the ocean offshore and it's probably not a great idea to be so close in a little boat. Um, in an attempt to, to con convey this concern about being close to the actively growing bench, HVO produced a map showing uh, a dotted b line that gives about a 300 meter or about three football field buffer around the active lava entry. And, and we felt, based on past experience with these collapses, that that was a pretty good safety margin. So we talked a lot with the National Park Service because this was all within the park. And they ev eventually ex uh, set up a rope line approximately following this, this area here to keep people at what we felt was a, a reasonably safe distance away. So the other hazard related to these ocean entries that I want to remind people about is that in addition to the collapsing delta, that mixture of superheated steam and uh, debris that's being formed at that interaction is, is pretty toxic and not good to breathe. So this cloud that you see emanating from the ocean entry is, consists of superheated steam, hydrochloric acid, which of course doesn't feel very good in your eyes, and uh, really tiny shards of volcanic glass. So this is not good stuff to breathe and not good stuff to get in your eye. That's one reason that uh, we recommend if people are, are going to walk in to see the ocean entry on a trade wind day, they come in from the Kalapana side. It's a little closer, but it's also upwind of this plume. But let's go back to the Delta collapse story. This was an aerial photo taken in late November of the eastern entry, which was the largest of the two. At this point, it was about 25 acres in size or about 25 football fields in area. And notice these prominent cracks running parallel to the shoreline. Uh, we saw these, I can't remember when we first saw them, but they were, of course, a telltale sign that the delta was unstable. And that at any time, these cracks could fail, could become failure surfaces for large chunks to be sliding away. Um, so Park Service was aware of this, and that was another reason to keep people um, at a safe distance. And here's a couple of cartoons that help describe, hopefully a little better than I did with words, actually how these bench collapses work. So in this cartoon, we, we've got lava flowing over the sea cliff, creating a steep apron of debris underwater. Uh, some of this is solid lava, some of it is this rubble that forms where, where the lava breaks apart when it meets the cold water. And you eventually get this sort of prograding, shelved layers of rubble and solid lava that can eventually be capped by fairly solid looking lava flows that are sub-horizontal. But as we saw in that last picture, these cracks can propagate quite deeply down under the, the ocean line. And then without warning, some of these cracks can become active and large chunks can just uh, peel away, exposing lava tubes and hot rocks suddenly to the cold water, which creates these steam explosions, sending blocks in all directions, um, superheated steam and scalding water that can splash up onto the seacoast. In the 34 years of activity at Pu'o'o, there have been, I think, at least four deaths from this process down there on the coast. So it is a serious phenomenon. Uh, and then after a collapse event, the, the danger has not passed because now you'll get new lava prograding out over the collapse feature uh, and basically the cycle begins anew. So wisely, the rope line was put in place and people were mostly kept at a safe distance. You still, with a good pair of binoculars or even with the naked eye, could see a lot of excitement and, and uh, great lava dri dribbling into the sea. Well, I want to take a short break here and switch to uh, an event that happened just on New Year's Eve. So I'm going to move from the mic. Things always happen on holidays. <laughs> so in 
So in the afternoon of New Year's Eve, the Park Service staff were down at the coast for helping uh, visitors out, started noticing uh, the beginning of collapses in the early afternoon. And uh, this is footage just showing what that looks like as pieces of the bench are peeling away into the ocean, liberating these clouds of debris. You see the black fine material, that's volcanic glass and ash and small bits, and then a much more robust plume of that, what we call lays. And here it is in the dusk hour showing the incandescence from the actual fragments of molten spatter being thrown up during these explosions. So it was pretty, pretty dramatic visually. And I'm sure there's, there's some other video out there on the internet that we haven't had time yet to capture. Um, but, but the thing about this event, which is very sobering, is that it began in the early afternoon. It occurred over a couple of hours into the evening. Um, most of that 26, 25, 26 acres or 25 football fields fell into the sea. And uh, then later in the evening, in, uh, later in the afternoon and evening, additional land adjacent to the delta, part of the old sea cliff, started sliding into the sea as well. And in fact, as I'll show in a minute here, there was, a, in, the, in terms of the map, a very small chunk of the public viewing area that was outside the rope line also fell away. Sorry, where's my mouse? Yeah. So this is some video, oops, where'd it go? Video taken the next day uh, by one of the HVO geologists who went down to see things, and it's showing essentially the decapitated lava tube that was feeding the lava distribution on the delta, um, beheaded by the collapse and kind of streaming into the ocean in a single stream. I don't know, this may be a couple of meters, a couple of yards wide here, but creating a very violent interaction at the ocean. And what you can see here is that most, well, I'll show you in a minute, but the most of the lava delta is gone. Oops. Hey, how does that happen? Time for a new computer, Andrea. Okay, here's another photo from, from uh, New Year's Eve during the collapse period taken by a, a park, park Service Ranger. Again, showing these clouds of volcanic ash laden debris uh, rising up above the explosions, the repeated explosions occurring here. And you can get a sense of waves generated by these explosions propagating out to sea. There were, I don't know, hundreds of people probably down there that afternoon watching this occur from mostly a safe distance up the coast away from the interaction. This was taken about 6 p.m. by another HVO person. So here's the map of what happened, and I'm sorry if this is a little tricky to see, um, but this shaded line here shows that 25, 26-acre lava delta that had formed uh, from July to December from lava entering the sea. And uh, this blue line here was the Park Service safety rope line, so folks were kept outside. The eventual collapse took a big bite out of the old sea cliff here, and that red arcuate area was what collapsed away sometime late on the evening of New Year's Eve, and you can see just a corner of the rope line got bitten away. Uh, it was very fortunate that there were no visitors here at the time. And I know park rangers that afternoon had, a couple of times at least, had to go get people to come back on this side of the rope line. So uh, again, a very sobering reminder of, of what could have happened. And I believe at this time, the Park Service has reopened the area with a view viewing area further to the east. Is that correct, Andrea? That's correct. That is correct, thank you. So they had it closed for a while until they reset the rope line and, and uh, worked with some HVO folks to try to evaluate where a safe place should be. But it was of interest to us that such a big bite of the old sea cliff was taken away during this collapse. And we're still mulling over what really caused that. Um, it's, it's like, I, I think there's a probability that the pre-Pu'uo'o sea cliff, which was back in about this direction, may have played a part. 
There's an old structural discontinuity here where the sea cliff was back in the early 90s. Uh, so this stuff may have just peeled away from that old discontinuity. It's also likely that there are rubble layers at the base of this part of the cliff that were progressively eroded by wave action during the last six months. Uh, so anyway, a, an interesting reminder that the process is not necessarily predictable and we need to build in some conservative uh, safety buffers. Here's a picture just taken yesterday also of that collapse bite through the old sea cliff. Um, so the uh, Park Service rope line just, is, uh, just out of view of this picture heading over the, the cliff here. But you can see it's a lot of a big sequence of layers of lava flows with rubble in between. And here's the active delta uh, reforming now a couple hundred meters away. This is a Park Service employees reestablishing that rope line. And it's still a very beautiful place. Uh, from a telephoto lens, you can see the lava streaming into the ocean. And then, of course, after dark, the colors become very beautiful. So that's what's going on in the East Rift Zone. And uh, you managed to be here for you or our visitors just a couple of days after a pretty exciting turn of events at the coast. And uh, if you want to go visit down there now, again, I think the Park Service has reopened it for both directions, and my recommendation would be to come in from the Kalapana side. Okay, how are we doing on time? Doing Getting great. short. Get some time for some questions if you want. Oh, I was going to keep going there, Dean, for oh, just a few more going. minutes. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> but I, I do see that I have used up most of my time talking about the East Rift Zone, and I was fearful of that because of this added uh, recent events of the, of the lava flow delta. So how about if I just jump through these really quickly and talk about the summit eruption here at Inhale Mau Mau. The, the great thing about that is that after the talk tonight or some other time, I hope you'll all go up to Jagger Museum Overlook and take a look at what you can see uh, firsthand because it's really pretty spectacular. The summit eruption began in March of 2008 and it is also still going. Uh, it's just a, a remarkable thing to see. Here's an aerial view taken with HVO and Jagger Museum in the foreground and uh, this lava lake down inside the Hale Mau Mau crater here in the distance. The, the advance button is a little slow. This is an aerial view just to orient you. Again, the uh, Hale Mau Mau is a pit crater within Kilauea Caldera. It's a little, little over a half a mile across and within it is the Overlook Crater Vent which at this point is uh, a little more than 740 feet in diameter here. And within that vent is a lava an active lava lake, one of the largest lava lakes on the planet. I apologize for the slowness. Maybe those videos choked it up a little bit. The eruption began in 2008 after a period of many months of increasing gas emissions at the summit. Um, HVO scientists in the park knew something was up because there were tremendous quantities of sulfur dioxide pouring out of Halimamo, way more than we'd measured for many, many years. Uh, in fact, so much gas that the Park Service closed the area to visitors because of the potential uh, health impacts. And then, and, and at the same time, there was also a harmonic, or there was also tremor, seismic tremor in the ground, indicating that magma was moving and close to the surface. And then uh, in, in March, uh, this area at the base of Hale Mau Mau wall here, this, this cliff is about 250 feet tall, became incandescent, actually started to glow because of the um, approach of magma towards the surface. This next image will show that incandescence as best we can. And then on March 19th, there was an explosion at that spot and a hole opened about 115 feet wide. And that hole was right at the base of the crater, and I circled here the former public o viewing overlook. Blocks were thrown up on there, hot blocks that burned the wooden posts and would most certainly have been fatal or injurious to anybody standing there. So nine years later, this little hole that was 115 feet wide is now large, quite large, and still growing. It's been growing primarily by wall collapse, and I'm just going to show you this one video that's an illustration of how that hole has grown from 115 feet to over 800 feet. <coughs> Definitely time for a new computer. <laughs> it's been a long time since Briggs and Stratton made a computer. <laughs> <laughs> Briggs and Stratton. 
While I'm waiting for this to load, I also want, I forgot to mention at the start that we are honored tonight by the presence of Thomas Jagger, who was the founder of Hawaiian, the Hawaiian Volcano Observatory in 1912. He's in the audience. Where is he? He's he a couple rows back. He's an extremely old man, <laughs> but just so you know, that's part of the park's living history, and the actor who plays Dr. Jagger is with us uh, in the audience. I'm not sure this is going to behave, Dean. Did you, did you whack the side of it and do the pull start like I showed you? I haven't tried that. I think it's... Okay. Thinking. So this, this hole has widened uh, through time primarily by wall collapse and wall retreat. And that's been a very spectacular process, not only because it's widened the hole and allowed the lava lake to grow in size, but when the wall collapses and, and falls into the active lava lake, uh, it creates this sudden vesiculation event, which is an explosion. And that explosion throws tons of debris up onto the rim of the crater. It's hot debris, and so it would... Uh, it's in a window behind your screen. Is it? Yeah, see the window in the back. Go to the top left. See, it's right back there. That's it. Yeah! Okay. <clears throat> okay. Yay. Patience. So this is actually from 2011, but the same process is, is occurring today uh, and most recently in early December. Keep your eye on this far wall of, of the, the Overlook Crater here, and you'll eventually see a very large piece peel in and impact the lava lake, which is uh, quite deep in this picture, and one of these big explosive events will occur. Now, in 2011, this happened on the far side of the lake, but you can still see the solid fragments flying through the air uh, and creating this significant dust plume which carries downwind. Some of those fragments are, you know, a meter across, and in subsequent explosions, the fragments landed on the rim, the southeast rim here, where we have a lot of our monitoring instruments. It's also where our scientists go every day to measure the depth of the lake uh, and do other kinds of readings. So it's not a place to take lightly, and if one of these events were to happen while somebody was standing on the rim, it, it could very well prove fatal as well. Dare I go back to the PowerPoint? <laughs> I'm going to jump ahead. Or try to. Well, it's hoping, hoping, hopefully loading. I'll just want to say that there's going to be a talk later this month um, on the 24th by Matt Patrick about how we study and watch that lava lake, and I'm sure that will be a really interesting talk for those of you who can make it. Uh, this, the accessibility of the lava lake has really made it a marvelous laboratory for all sorts of measurements using new techniques, new camera technology, um, new gas measurement technology, and from that, we're learning a lot about the dynamics of these active lava lake systems and, indeed, how the summit lava lake is related to the East Rift Zone and how they interact with each other through time. Uh, I will tell you that right now we're in a period of essentially high pressurization of Kilauea Volcano where the lava lake is very high. That summit reservoir system that I, we looked at in that early cartoon is very full. And so we're having periods of earthquakes up here that reflect that fullness. Uh, the long-term tilt and inflation record at the summit is very high, very positive. Um, and there are times when we have reversals in that trend and we see deflations. You can almost think of it as the volcano exhaling or breathing. 
Um, and during those times, we sometimes see a response out at the Puo event down in the East Rift Zone. So we know they're connected, and that's really a, a main focus of a lot of the work going on here is to try to understand the details of that connection and what that plumbing system looks like. So I'll just close here with a couple of slides, and one just to recap kind of the highlights of the last year. Really, the reaching of the ocean by episode 61G lava flow has been a, a seminal event for Kilauea volcano watchers. And the big question, of course, is how long will it last? How long will that lava continue to flow into the ocean? It's not really showing any sign of, of slowing down. As we saw from the recap of other Pu'uo'o episodes, this can go on for years in this capacity. However, there is that nagging little finger going to the northeast off of Pu'uo'o that could potentially develop into the dominant flow. We just have to watch and see. Um, this recent event on New Year's Eve showing a, a rather large, one of the largest delta collapses that we've seen at the coast. And then the big bite taken out of the old sea cliff poses the question to us, what does that process really mean and how can we perhaps better assess the hazards going into the future of the region around the growing delta? Um, as I said, the summit lava lake here remains very high and the reservoir is very pressurized. For volcano watchers, that's a good thing. That should mean that the lake level remains high and visible. Um, it, but it could also transition to another end result, which would also be very interesting. If the lake becomes high enough and the reservoir engorged enough, we might have an intrusion of melt from that reservoir system into a different part of the volcano, the southwest drift zone or the southern caldera. And conceivably, we could even have a new breakout of lava. So when we get, if we have another episode coming up of a lot of earthquakes in a very short period of time in another part of the volcano's summit area, uh, that might be a clue that we're leading to a new breakout. Another point I'll make uh, comes from the work, the final one here, of Don Swanson, one of our geologists who goes down to the lake just about every day to collect ash and other Pele's hair and other material that's come out of the lake overnight. He has recently noticed what he thinks is a multi-month trend in the amount of material that correlates with the, with the level of the lava lake. And he's posing the hypothesis that we're actually measuring for the first time, potentially, um, a fine scale, meaning on the order of months, pulsing of, of molten material into that summit reservoir and to the surface in the form of the lava lake. So if that holds up, that'll be a really interesting glimpse into some of the, the fine detail of the supply of magma to the summit of Kilauea. And I also want to point out in the coming year, we've got some new uh, studies and new technology coming online. So next year's talk, hopefully we'll have some results from that. In the summer, we are going to work with some British scientists to install a radar system on the summit, at the, on the rim of the summit lava lake here. And this will allow us to track that lava lake in detail in terms of its level and surface characteristics in real time. So that's pretty exciting. We also have uh, purchased a higher resolution thermal camera, which uh, Matt Patrick, who I'm sure will do some very interesting things, including maybe some stereo imaging of the lava lake to look at its circulation dynamics. Next, this, this month, we're actually working with some NASA scientists to do some more studies of the volcanic gas plume that's coming out of that lava lake, the thousands of tons per day of sulfur dioxide and other gases. Um, there's, there's still quite a bit more to learn about what's in them, in, the, in that plume, and how it transitions chemically and physically downwind. And then finally, that lava flow 61G that made it to the coast uh, was a great experiment that we were able to tackle in that it was a single long lava flow that for several months didn't go into the ocean and slowly prograded down slope. So our scientists made a series of very careful uh, detailed maps of the lava flow using overflight imagery from helicopter, detailed digital elevation models so we can calculate the volumes at different time stamps very accurately. And this will help us understand something about the effusion rate, how much lava was coming out at different times through the course of the 61G eruption. And all of that will hopefully help us better understand how Pahoehoe flows and Pahoehoe flow fields develop. So the next time one's heading towards Pahoa, we might be able to give a little better intelligence about what to expect when. So I think I'll stop there. Thank you. <laughs> Apologies for the computer problems. Questions? Yes? Do any of these delta collapses, uh, do they pose any kind of risk uh, for a localized tsunami? They absolutely do. Um, we don't have a lot of observational data for these in the past, but there is a video that I've seen of a small fishing boat that was almost swamped uh, just offshore of a small collapse. But absolutely, there were waves observed during the New Year's Eve collapse series. 
Uh, I guess a good question is how big a tsunami is possible, and I'm not sure I can answer that. But yes, Thank you. one concern. Tina, I have a, oh, Tom, a comment Tim. as well. Um, <laughs> I just talked to one of the park uh, guys tonight about that who was down there, and he said that there were waves washing up onto the sea cliff itself when these chunks mm -hmm. were falling in, and the water would then cascade back off as waterfalls back off <coughs> the sea cliff. So big enough that it's reaching up onto the sea cliff where people could potentially be standing. So quite, quite high. <laughs> More questions. Yes. Is there, Is there anything that can be done to divert a lava flow? <laughs> That's a very difficult question. Uh, yes, there are there are techniques, uh, and they've been tried around the world. Um, the Icelanders are famous for trying to spray seawater to cool off lava flows. Uh, in at Etna, in Italy, they bulldoze large berms of older lava to try to direct the lava flows. So te these techniques have been tried and they've met with limited success. They're very, very expensive. They don't always work. Um, there's always the concern about if you divert a lava flow from your house and it goes into your house, then who's responsible and who pays? So it's a complex decision matrix that the authorities have to go through. In addition, here in Hawaii, there are people who believe it's, it's really um, not a good thing to do to interfere with the activity of a lava flow based on their relationship with lava as a deity. So it's a complicated thing. And I know this came up during the Pahoa lava flow crisis. And um, at the time, the mayor and, and civil defense chief were not interested in pursuing this. Yeah, other questions? You have to give me one more so I can tell George that I can answer, repeat the question. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, good question. Well, there, there must be a net advance over geologic time to, to allow the island to expand, but it is a give and a take. Could you repeat the question? Oh. <laughs> I had the best of intentions. George, the question was, if the lava deltas are collapsing, how is the island getting bigger? How is land actually being added? And there, there is, it must be a net advance, a net... Uh, <laughs> In other words, the, the delta building outweighs the collapsing. And at some point, the area offshore will develop enough, uh, a low enough slope angle to allow these lava flows to remain intact long enough. However, again, thinking on long-term geologic time, as you probably know, these islands like to fall apart. And there are enormous cliffs on the north shore of Molokai and uh, even mantles on the west flank of Mauna Loa here that are old, enormous landslide failure scarps where very large chunks of thousands of feet of the island have slid away at times past. So gravity always wins, I guess is what I'll say. One more question, says Dean. Yes, sir. Is there any documentation of the lava coming out underwater? Documentation, is there any documentation of lava coming out underwater? Yes, there is. There's some spectacular footage taken back during the Mauna Ulu eruption between 1969 and 1974 uh, by scuba divers, including volcanologists just off the south coast, not far from where this activity is happening. And these very brave and skilled divers got very close to these underwater lava streams. And I'm sure you can find this on, on the internet and YouTube, um, this process of forming lava pillows where the lava kind of buds out in this bulbous, round, grape bunch fashion. And with each, each little bulb that forms is kind of a little explosion. It's really quite something to see. Yep. But that was some of the first documentation of underwater lava from that, that eruption. Yep. Oh, Dean, while you're walking up, one more question in the back. Uh, what is the temperature on that uh, summit uh, lava? The summit lava lake. Molten magma right now, molten lava right now, Kilauea, is just a little over 2,000 degrees Fahrenheit, about 1,150 Celsius, something on that order. The temperature of the lava, did I say it? What was the temperature of the lava? 